Man, that's good, right? It's always good to have men step up and be leaders and women step up and be leaders. And it's always good that when you're moving in a church and you see things always moving. And once again, I am always amazed at some of the song selections that happen in this church. I'm always amazed at um, some of the things I even heard this morning. Um, on the way, you know, just preparing and looking at my message and coming in and just talking to a few people in the office this morning about it. And then I come up and I put my message up here and I'm walking around the crowd and somebody says, I got to tell you this praise report of something that I saw God do. I just got to share it with you. And I'm sitting there I'm thinking, if this person only knew what I was preaching on today, they would be amazed. And I think that, you know, and you know who you are out there that I talked to this morning. And you had to stop me and just tell me about a praise report. And, and it is amazing to me that God takes all this stuff. And I'm standing right back there as they're leading worship. And CJ's talking about Jerry, you know, been with us for, you know, this many years. And, and how he was able to be used yesterday in the jails. And I want to tell you something. It's not a mistake, every single thing. I believe that God is a God of detail. I believe that every single thing that happens, if we allow it to happen, that God can use every single thing to bring it all together, to make it all work, and all we have to do is open our eyes to it. That's what I believe. And, and, and I don't know if you believe that way. I don't know if you believe that God talks to you that way and God works that way. But with me, there is too much evidence showing that things just work out in, in a certain pattern that, that God says this cannot be a mistake this morning. You're talking about this topic that is so important for the church. So important. You see, two weeks ago, I preached a sermon on the three defining moments of your life. One is, is you have to accept Christ. You have to say, Lord, I will follow you. God already wants you. You need to understand that. But you have to decide, I'm going to follow. That's one thing you have to do. The second thing you have to do is you have to count the cost. It's going to cost you something to follow Christ. It just is. It, there's no way getting around it. You, we can monkey around it. We can act like it's not. We can act like you don't have to jump through a bunch of hoops. But the truth is, is once you go through this part, once you accept him, once you recognize that you're a savior, it's going to cost you something to follow Christ. It's going to cost you some obedience. It's going to cost you some discipline. You're not going to be able to do some things that you did in your past. You're going to have to change. You're going to get some new friends. I guarantee you, all those things are going to happen. And we can sugarcoat it. We can act like, you know, whatever we want. But it's going to cost you something. And then the second, third, the third thing, the defining moment was staying, you know, committed. That you have to, not only do you have to make a choice for Christ, not only do you have to count the cost, but when things get really hard, and if you haven't been to that point where they've got really hard, just hold on, honey, because they're coming. It's coming. I promise you it's coming. If it ain't got hard yet, it is coming. There's going to be a pastor that's going to make you mad. going to be an elder that's going to make you mad. There's going to be a Sunday school teacher that's going to make you mad. Somebody's going to upset you in the church. It's coming. And that's that moment that, that James is talking about where it says, in this moment, you have got to stay. Just stay true. Stay connected. Just stay with it because that's going to be the thing that's going to grow you. Now, I would love to tell you that those three defining moments are it, right? That that's it. And you can just relax and just sit back and chill out. But the truth is, is that's not it. There's one more, there's one more thing. And this is kind of like, I guess, a part two to, to what I preached the last time. And this is the last defining moment. But you see, uh, it, it, I just think it's amazing to me when I, when I start looking at this stuff. And when, when God puts something on my heart to preach it, the Lord told me this week, he said, I want you to understand, this is what I want you to preach on this week, girl. Is that the people that are sitting in the church have to share their faith. They have to share their faith. And it's a little word that we call evangelism. This morning I was talking to someone in the office and I said, see how this morning we're going to be talking about evangelism. And you know what they told me? They said, haven't heard that word in a long time. I said, I know it, right? You right? You know why? Because the truth is, if we were to admit it, if I'm going to let the cat out of the bag that revived this morning, the word evangelism and sharing our faith outside the church is, for the most part, on life support. It is. It's on life support. 
What do you mean? You mean, no, 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 no. There are opportunities that God gives us on a daily basis, not a weekly basis, on a daily basis to be the light and to share our faith and to tell people about Christ, to lead people to Christ. And, and the truth is, is there's many times as we as Christians, and me included, right, I'll walk right past people a thousand times a day. Well, a thousand times a day, man, every single day, I'll walk past people and God will, I mean, he won't always tell me but I know that there are opportunities that God has for me that if I would open my eyes just a little bit more, that, that, that I, if, if I would just evangelize just a little bit more, if I would share my faith just a little bit more, if the people at the gas pumps and at my job place and even at the church sometimes would see just Christ in me just a little bit more, it might be the defining moment in their life where they can start out at point A and just accept Christ because Christ already wants them. Do you know that every single person that you walk past, every single person that you walk past, you know, God has a, has a defining moment saying, I want them. Do you realize that I want them? And you see, when we accept Jesus as our personal Savior, when we've had a monumental thing happen in our life, it requires and it calls for a response to what people see in us. Now, I'm not talking about those radical nuts, y'all. I ain't talking about the person, that, and we, everybody's seen one in your lifetime, man. I'm, I'm talking about the person that just comes up, gets right in your space, jumps right in your bubble, they're right in your face, and all of a sudden you're trying to talk to them, and you're feeling more of the devil than you are God, but they're sitting here trying to swing this Christianity thing on you. I remember one time I was at Walmart, and me and my wife was standing there, and we were talking to this guy, and we went on for like 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour, and all of a sudden it got real uncomfortable. And I'm looking at him like, you're crazier than a bat loon. See, at first, when we first started out, he was all into it. Man, I love the Lord, and the Lord loves me. And, and, and I'm going to tell you, we, we as the church, man, we're called to be the church and all this other stuff. And as I started listening to him, all of a sudden it hit me, this cat don't even go to church. <laughs> so I just said, I said, hey, hold on a second. Where do you go to church? I don't go to church. I said, why don't you go to church? I don't like the church. And I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, does he know what I do? And I'm looking at Linda and Linda's looking at me and I'm thinking, and Linda's always got this thing. She can just get out like, I gotta go pick up some butter. And just leave me standing there with some crackhead in Walmart who's trying to talk to me about God. And I'm like, I know Jesus. And I finally, I just told him, I said, man, I'm gonna tell you, you're crazy, bro. You're crazy, man. I'm, I'm, he said, that's what everybody thinks. I'm crazy. I'm crazy. Everybody thinks I'm crazy. And I said, but dude, you got to back up just a little bit. Give me just a little bit of space because, see, when this conversation started out, I was over here and you were over there. Now you're right here. And I'm trying to just talk. I said, how are you going to win anybody to Christ when you're talking the way you're talking? That you're talking like a Looney Tune, man. You see, that's not what I'm talking about, folks. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not saying you go to Walmart today and, and you just run up to everybody and you get in their personal space and you're trying to join the fitting room with them and get in there and talk to them while they're trying to... That ain't what I'm talking about. I'm talking about where you literally are just shining the light so much is in you that even if you don't say a word, people want what you have. That's the kind of light that I'm talking about today. And I think there are moments, man, where we shine. I think there's moments, man, where God, just, we just know that God was there. Just like yesterday when those guys, man, they were all talking to me earlier about it. And they're like, man, we know God showed up. Man, I really believe God uses those moments to have a great impact on people's lives. And sometimes we're the lives that get touched more than them. You know what I mean? I've seen it happen in my own personal life. I've handed out socks and candy canes at a, at a Campbell County jail on five different floors, and I walked out of there and felt like that God had done me more of a favor than he did them. You know, getting to preach the gospel to them and talk to them. and You know, I, I've seen God move in those moments. But here's the thing I want to share with you, is that every single day, churches, listen, every Sunday, churches are filled with people that throughout the week, for the most part, People don't even know that we're Christians. 
Like we're walking past people on a daily basis, walking past people, and, and, and it's just, I mean, we're just, you know, not even investing time, and we're not even looking for this moment that God has. And God is saying, I am so much more than that. If you would realize, like, how critical this whole thing is, you accepting me and me and us being in this relationship, you would, you would see that this moment, there may be nobody else that will ever share the gospel than you with that person. Somebody that I might not ever meet. You might be the only one to ever meet them. You might be the only person to ever step onto a job site. You might be the only person to ever offer up prayer. You might be the only person that ever talks about Jesus to this person. And you might be the thing that causes them to have some defining moments in their life. And that is critical, folks. It's critical. One of the things, I want to talk about something kind of uncomfortable, really. I felt uncomfortable about it, but now I kind of love it. All right. One of the things that I had been introduced to kind of new in this church in the last probably, I would say, two months, three months at, at, at the longest, um, we have been doing something a little different, and you've seen it. We've even had questions even come at us as pastors and elders as a question, and is this right? Or, or should we be doing what you're doing? And, and one of the things that we've seen, and it, is, it was kind of a little uncomfortable until I really sat down and digested it, right? Um, but we had been fielding a lot of people um, wanting other people to baptize them. It just, it just, it's been happening. And, and, and it's almost been happening almost like either every week or like every other week. Like somebody else other than me and Josh is baptizing someone. And can I tell you that as I grew up in church all my life, I very seldom ever, ever seen that in my life. I've never seen, other than the pastor doing it, and every once in a while you'll see a father and the kids are like, I want daddy to baptize me and dad does it. And, and, but other than that, I really haven't seen that. And then when it came up where people were like, no, 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 I want this person to baptize me. Then it kind of puts us in a position to say, okay, well, how do we feel about that? And, and, and so we've had to kind of, me and Josh has had to kind of think about it and really talk about it. And, and I want to tell you, one of the most encouraging things that we have ever seen in this church is when somebody steps up out of the audience and walks forward and says, I want this person right here that was sitting back beside me back there to come up here and baptize me up here. Why? Because they've been the most influential thing in my life for Christianity. Do you know how big that is for our congregation? Now, I want you to just swallow and digest this because by the time that you leave here, I want you to say this, I want to baptize somebody this year. Amen. That's what I want to have happen. I want you to be so influential in somebody's life that you say, you know what? It ain't just for the pastors. It ain't just for elders. It ain't just for teachers. It ain't just for youth pastors. That everybody sitting in here it's called to go and, and, and to make disciples of all nations and baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And there's nowhere, trust me, I spent eight years in college going to a very, very good Christian school. I spent another 15 to 17, 18 years working in the church. There is nowhere in the Bible that you will ever read, I promise you, there's nowhere in the Bible that you'll ever read that a pastor or an elder has to be the one to baptize his people. You will not see it. If, 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 I know that we grew up with it, folks, but the truth is it's not in there that we all had the capability to change someone's life, to actually walk them through the, you know, through the sinner's prayer. We all have the ability to say, listen, I want you to accept Jesus. And one of the things that accepting Jesus is you got to recognize that you're a sinner. You need to understand who Jesus is. And, and, and all, you got to follow through in baptism. And if they're at your house on a Saturday night at 9 o'clock, all you have to do is say, listen, we can take care of this right now. We don't have to call up the pastor. We don't have, all we got to do is let's go jump in the swimming pool outside. That's all you got to do. Don't have a swimming pool? No problem. Jump in the bathtub. Fill that thing up. Let some water run out on your floor. You can clean it up. That's all you have to do. Now, am I downplaying baptism? Absolutely not. Because in the Bible, they would stop at the side of the road if there was a big enough puddle that you could get a body in and do it. I'm not downplaying. You don't have to have holy water. You don't have to have it sprinkled. Listen, all you have to do is go through that process of the full immersion baptism and it could be in a lake, it could be in a swimming pool, it could be in a bathtub, it could be here at Revive, it doesn't matter. And anybody can do it. And I challenge anybody in here to find some place, and I know it's made us a little uncomfortable. 
I know that there's been people sitting out there that have said, ah, Pastor Josh, what do y'all feel about this? I get it. Why? Because I'm there too. I get it. But what I'm saying is that if every one of us, if every single one of us would invest in a life to the point to bring them to Christ, what a pleasure it would be if everybody in here would say, my goal this year, for the remainder of the year, is I'm going to baptize somebody. I'm going to affect somebody's life so much that I'm going to, I am going to have, I'm going to baptize them. I'm hoping that they want me to baptize them, but I'll let the pastor do it, whatever. It don't matter. But I'm just saying, I, I, I'm going to invest in a life enough to watch the kingdom. Listen, I want to watch the kingdom change. And that should be the focus of every single Christian that calls themselves a follower of Jesus, is that I am going to share my faith. And that sharing your faith, that word that you haven't heard in a long, long time in churches, it's called evangelism. That's what it's called. Sharing your faith outside the church is really called evangelism. That's what it's called. So listen, here's what I want to share just a couple things with you today. If we do not evangelize, people cannot respond. That's it. You can't hope for them to just walk in here while we're, while we're telling them not to park in front of Avon, right? That's enough right there just to turn people off. I get it. I know. I know how it is. You don't want me to park here. I'm not going to come to your church. Listen, let's not wait for them just to, just to cruise up into our church. Let's not wait for them to come up and just hear a sermon. Let's, let's affect their lives in the neighborhoods. Let's affect their lives in our workplaces so that we can literally change the number of people that go to heaven that are around us. But if we do not evangelize, if we do not share our faith, people cannot respond. I want you to listen to this verse, Romans 10, 14. How then will they call on him who have not believed? And how are they to believe in him who have not Never heard. Listen to this. And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Do you know I have heard this in about every ordination service that I've ever been involved with where somebody gets or, or, you know, ordained and, and, and a lot of times the pastor that's ordaining them will use this scripture. Then how are they calling them and who have not believed and how they were believing him and they have never heard and, and how are they to hear without someone to preach? It's a great message for an ordination. But the truth is, is that if we think that that was saved just for the preachers, we should be reevaluating the book of Romans. We really should. Because what this is really saying is that, listen, if you don't go tell them, they're not going to be told. And if you don't go tell them, they can't respond to the gospel. And if they don't respond to the gospel, they will never be in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that, for the church, has to be a real problem. This is not just a pastor's um, declaration of ordination. That's, that's, not what that, that's not what it is. We are called as Christians to literally go and evangelize and tell people about Jesus. And that's just all it's to it. Listen to this. Another portion where Jesus commands it to evangelize. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Now this is called the Great Commission. This is what, if you were looking for any place in the Bible that says, what should the church be about? What should I be about as a Christian? And there's so many people that come to me and say, Pastor, I just don't know what to do. I don't really know what my calling is. Listen, if you can't figure out your calling, just read the wall right here. This is it. Write it down. This is what you're called to do. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven on earth has been given me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you and behold I am with you always to the end of the age do you realize that this yes this was the commission of the 12 disciples but this was the commission of every single person that ever accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior that you, as you live in your neighborhoods, and as you go to your work every day, and as you come, and you come into your community every day, as you're driving around, you should be looking for opportunity every single day. If you're a school teacher, you got more opportunity with kids than most people have. You got more opportunity with the kids than the parents got with the kids. Think about it. You spend more quality time with a child in school then that child spends with their parent. Because by the time they get off a of school bus at 4 o'clock, they still got to get supper in, they still got to get the baths in, and most parents put their kids in bed around 9 or 9.30 at night, so they've only got a 4 or 5 hour window. You spend more quality time with children than their parents do. 
And what a difference you can make as being a light for Christ. Well, I'm not allowed to preach the gospel. I'm not, listen, here's what I'm telling you. You don't have to say a word for people to know who you're associated with. Linda told me yesterday, she was at the ark, and they were doing an Operation Christmas Child um, thing where a guy was there, lives in Louisville, and had a, had a box, and, and Linda said this guy walked up, and, and he, everything about this guy screamed that he was a pastor before he ever even said a word. And I believe that can be same thing be true with you as a follower of Jesus Christ. The way you smile with people. The way you walk up and just greet them. If you walk up and you're kind of like, just like, Phew, that's not going to win them, folks. That's not going to be an open door, I promise you. You don't have to say a word. Why am I telling you everything I'm telling you today? And listen, if you're not listening to this sermon... I challenge you this. Do you really love Christ? If we don't share our faith, do we really love God? If we don't listen to me, this is critical. Why is it so critical? If we are not sharing our faith with the lost and dying world that is going to hell. Paul would say, right out of the Bible, they wrote 70% of the New Testament. He would say, then you, my friend, are not a follower of the Jesus that I know. How do you know that? Well, listen to this. This was Paul's heart for the loss, right? Man, if this ain't a wake-up call for me, and if this ain't a wake-up call for you, I don't know what would be. Paul speaking in Romans 9. And this is what he says. Romans 9, 1 through 3. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. Any time that, that somebody in the Bible tells you that I'm speaking in the name of Christ, I'm speaking, you know, what I'm telling you, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying to you. That means that you can pretty much write it down and you can just put it in your pocket and you can count on it for the rest of your life. That this person, when they're saying what he's doing in a way. Now I know that some of you think this is taking God's name in vain, but it's really not. What, what Paul just did right there will say, I swear to God. That's what Paul just did. That's exactly what Paul just did when he said that. I am speaking the truth in Christ. So he is saying that what I'm about to say, I'm not lying, but I'm putting Christ's name right at the forefront to say I'm even saying it on his name. Listen, I'm speaking the truth in Christ, and I am not lying to you. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I wish that I myself would have cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers. Folks, I don't know if you can get a grasp on what that just said. But I hope you can. Because what Paul just said right there. This is what Paul just said. Listen to me. Paul said... If everybody that I knew would go to heaven, I would be willing to go to hell to make sure that happened. That's what Paul just said. Paul said, I would give up my salvation if everybody that I knew went to heaven. That's how serious that this is, is Paul was saying, I'm staking my life. I'm willing to give up. I'm willing to be a curse. Listen to this. <laughs> I am not lying. This is what Paul says. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unce unceasing anguish in my heart. This is really bothering him. That people are not going to heaven. For I, listen, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers. How many of us live a life in such a way to where we look at people in our neighborhood and say, I would rather go to hell if it meant that everybody in my neighborhood went to heaven. What would that mean? What would that even look like to us? What would that look like to the church if you went to lunch today at church, wherever you eat, whatever you do? What would it look like if you went in with that type of heart that every person in this place that I'm around that I would rather they go than me go. And people would say, no, Paul really couldn't love that much. 
Paul really, there's no way Paul could really, you know, I mean, is it true that Paul, I mean, could he really mean that? Well, I want you to think about it, just a couple things. Paul was shipwrecked. Paul was beaten. Paul was stoned. Paul was chained in a dungeon while all the people around him were pooping right on the floor, draining all around them. I just want you to think about what I'm saying. He was whipped more than once, beat more than once, chained more than once, wrote a lot of his letters from prison. And every single time that you saw Paul's interaction with how he felt about Christ, he was all about saying, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters but for people to know Jesus. Nothing else matters but for people to decide to follow Jesus. I love God that much is what Paul was saying, is that I'll go through beatings, I'll go through chainings, I'll go through and being stoned and left for dead. Do you know they stoned Paul and they left him for dead? And Paul got back up, listen, he got back up and went right back into the same city that just stoned him to preach the gospel again. Did you know that ha happened? Like, Paul was so serious in the Bible. And I know, man, it's like, man, you're really preaching some hard stuff there, Earl. I know. Why? Because it's life and death. <laughs> That's what it is. It's a matter of life and death for, like, your neighbors. It's a matter of life and death. But what's it look like? What's it look like to go out and, and, and really be a light to your community? Does it look like preaching sermons? No, it don't look like that at all. It looks a lot less than probably what you would even expect. Sometimes it's building a deck. Sometimes it's just going and cleaning out sewers. Sometimes it's going and knocking down a house. Sometimes it's just taking care of a neighbor that's right next door that hasn't had her grass mowed in forever and, 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 and her, you know, her lawnmower broke down and so you just go over there and you mow that grass. Sometimes it's just knowing that you're, you know, your families don't have food, so you take them some groceries, and you just say, you know, Jesus loves you very much. That's sometimes what it looks like. Sometimes it's that coworker that comes to you, and they've been coming to you over and over and over, and they're talking about this spouse that they really can't stand. And, and you know, I mean, I've, I've been talking to people a lot at work where they tell me, you know, well, you know, I think I want to get a divorce. And I said, well, what makes you want to get a divorce? And they said, well, when I wake up in the morning, I want to put a pillow over their head and smother them. I think it's time to get out. And I said, that sounds pretty crazy, bro. But the truth is, is that God never intended for you to ever get a divorce. And you remember when you first loved her? Remember when you first, when you first stood in front of your family and your friends and you said, I do, and you really meant it that day? How do we get back to that place? And you see, sometimes it's just being a friend and being there and loving people. It doesn't have to look like we think it has to look like. You know, everywhere Jesus went, I never ever heard, Jesus always told hard, hard stuff. But you know, he always had so much grace for people that were just involved with sin. Where's our grace at? What do we say to the woman that walks up? Listen, what do we say to the woman that walks up that's had multiple husbands, her life's a wreck, she's living in sin at that current time? Do we look like Jesus and say, listen, if you drink from my well, you'll never thirst again. You see, first she saw grace. What's it look like when the lady that's caught in adultery, they're getting ready to stone her, and Jesus walks up. Out of every single person that should have been critical of this woman, it should have been the one that hadn't sinned in the place. That was Jesus. And Jesus draws a line in the sand and looks at all the people that thought they were so religious, and he says, you all think you're so good. Well, you just, whoever sinned, you know, whoever has a sin, you just cast the first stone. Where's the grace that the church has for people that are hurting? You see, yesterday when our men went down and they played softball with them and they were just being friends with them and they were playing and, and, and talking to them, what they were really doing is they were saying, your life matters. Your life matters. Your life matters. And it should matter enough to the church when people are out hurting to want to share Christ. And be a monumental, you know, just moment in their life where they say, I want what you have because what you have is real. I want that. I want that. Matthew 5, 15 to 16 says, Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. 
Think about that. We come into church and we flood into churches every week all over the world. And then we go out and all of a sudden it's like we're some secret Christian. That was the title of the sermon today, Secret Christian. Like we have a, we have a, a mentality that we're able to conduct business... We're able to do business affairs. We're able to do work. We're able to do everything that we do in our life and secretly get through this moment of a week where nobody really, their life is really affected unless we purposely try to affect people's lives. Folks, I want to tell you, if you don't think evangelism in the church is dead, just start going polling churches. How many neighbors do we knock on? How many doors do we knock on? How many people do we really sit down, the people that we really love in our own families? Let's forget the neighbors. In our own families, the people that we know that are lost, how many people are we going and we're saying, hey, I want to talk to you on Tuesday night. Listen, I'm going to be at your house on, on Friday night. So, I mean, I'm going to bring dinner. You don't have to worry about it. But we just got to sit down and have a conversation. Like people that you know, that you're related to, and you sit down and you just sit there and you say, listen, I got to talk to you about something that's really been on my heart. I love God. And God loves you very much. And I know that when I die, I'm going to heaven. But listen, there, you know, I just got to know, man, where are you at? Because I haven't seen you in church in like four years. And, and are you mad at God? What's going on? I need to get to the bottom of this. And I love you enough. Like, we don't even do that with our own families anymore. So how are we going to do that with our neighbors? And I feel like God is saying, Earl, I want you to tell the church. That this secret Christianity thing that we live out, it's not working for the church. Because do you know that most people that are a youth, that, that when they get done with youth group, do you know there's a large percentage of them that sees us as the adults? Have you ever noticed that once they get out of the youth group and once they get out of that first little job, they're gone. And they're seeing something that's not real. Because if we don't invest in our neighborhoods, if we don't invest in our counties, if we don't invest in the lives of people around us, how real can it really be, this thing called Christianity? You see, this week, I, I've been sick and tired, man, of Facebook, y'all. I have seen more Christians. Oh, well, I'm going to say it. I'm letting the big elephant cat right out of the bag right now. I have seen more Christians this week so fired up over the national anthem. I mean, I'm talking about laying it out on Facebook. Uh, this is not right. And these are high-paid NFL players. And this, and this, and this, and this. I'm just, I just turned my Facebook off and I said, I'm going to have to see you in about a week. Because this is about ridiculous. What's your stance on it, Earl? I ain't going to tell you my stance on it. You know why? Because it's a football game. Well, it's more important than that. It's our country. That's true. It's our country. Should it fire you up that people don't stand up? Absolutely it fires me up. But what fires me up more than that is that nobody gets fired up by the people going to hell that's living in their neighborhoods. We can get more fired up on social network over something that has nothing to do in an eternal perspective of value. That is my problem. I mean, I've seen people... I mean, listen... Listen, when you start burning your jerseys and your jackets and your season tickets and that's your big moment in life? Like you've seen it this week on Facebook. You, I mean, they're like, there's like, yeah, this is my San Francisco jacket right here. That's it. Here's my season tickets right here. I'm done with you, NFL. The NFL has never saved you. The NFL has never died on a cross for you. I mean, should we support our, listen, should we support our military? Absolutely. But I'm just talking about the stance that people take. We get more fired up over things that have no eternal value whatsoever. To the point where we will stand our ground and we will fight. And all of a sudden, what if God was to come down and say, but you realize that you've been living next door for 15 years from somebody that's going to hell and you haven't got fired up once. Why not? Well, I don't know. I've just got used to doing things the way I've always did them. 
Can I tell you something about that whole NFL thing? I've been watching football for like 30 years. And I'm sick and tired of losing anyway. I mean, the Bengals are terrible. Let the, I mean, come on, man. The Bengals are bad. And I watch them every week. And I love football. But they're bad. But do, can I tell you something? Do you know that both NFL teams used to stay in the locker rooms throughout the national anthem every single game? They didn't always used to be standing outside, standing in attention. Did you know that the NFL teams used to always be inside the locker room and they were always planning and everything that the national anthem was doing was only for the audience? That all the field would be inside the locker room preparing and the national anthem was for the people that came to the game. Why do we get so fired up or something? They, none of them. They were all sitting down in the locker room. They didn't come out. It don't matter. Here's my point today. If I got a point, other than the Bengals are bad. And you're not going to find anybody in this place that loves the Bengals more than me. I promise you. I mean, I about punched Josh right in the face last week. I ain't going to lie to you. If I could have went through the phone, he knew it too. Because I, 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 I didn't get home. I had to go to a family reunion after church. And I get home and I, and, I, and, and I tape the Bengals. And please don't ever text me what's going on with the Bengals. I don't care if they're losing by 100. I don't want to know. It's a big secret for me. So I take the game, and, and I'm at a family reunion. I get home about 4 o'clock, right? And I'm sitting there, and I'm watching. I'm in the third quarter, and the third quarter was really good. They were up, right? They're winning. And all of a sudden, I get this text from Pastor Josh. He says, well, I'll bet you're about sick of this Cincinnati Bengals stuff, ain't you? And I'm looking, I said, oh, I'd break his legs right now if he was here. I'd, I said, no, I don't know. I'm still in the third quarter. And he sent me a text right back and he goes, no, I was talking about all the protesters and stuff. And I said, no, you wasn't. No, now I know that the Bengals have done blown another game. So don't ever tell me about what's going on. So I love football. I love the Bengals. But the truth is, is I love Christ a whole lot more Amen. than I love any of that. Amen. Christ only loses when we don't do the job. Amen. I want to call the band back up here, but I want, to give you, I want to give you just a kind of an illustration or a picture in your mind. As you're going through your week this week. So I want you to imagine... If you've ever flown on an airplane at any point in your life, raise your hand. All right, maybe it'd be better. If you've never flown on an airplane, raise your hand. Okay, we got some people never flown. All right. So you know, or, or you should know by watching at least commercials, that when, when you go through an airport, you know, as you're walking through an airport and you're ready trying to get to the area where your flight's taken off, you know, you have all these um, gates. They call them gates, right? Like it might be A36, A35, or B, or C, or D. And, and so there's all these gates, and you see all these people. They're all crowd around the gate of their destination of where they're going. And I always find that interesting because as I'm going through, um, you know, like a terminal, I, I like to look at the, at the billboards to say, well, this one's going to Boston. Like everybody here is going to Boston. And I just think that's neat. I just think it's cool. Or everybody here is going to California, and I'm looking, and it's like, Anthem, California. And I'm like, like yeah, all them people are going to California. That's awesome. And as, as, as you go through, some of you'll see like Kansas City, and you'll see Detroit, and Chicago, and all these destinations. And all these people are grouped all together. And this week, God was like, I want you to think about that just for a second. Because how many people do you know in your life, Earl, right now, that their destination is hell? Like as you walk by, like you're walking by, Earl, and you're, you're passing these people, and they're sitting in the area, and their life, their destination is not in a relationship with me. walking by 
Or do you say, I need to spend some time in this area? I got to spend some time in this section of my life where there's people that don't know Christ. What do we do? As you go through your as you go through your week this week, I want you to think about this. You're walking through your week. You're you're getting up in the morning, and some of you have got a lot of busy, busy week coming up, right? Well, I got to get up Monday, and I got to do this, and I got to get up Tuesday, and I got to do this, and I got to get up Wednesday, and I got to do this, and Thursday is this, and Friday is this. I want you to think about something. As you're going through your week this week, as you pass people, and you see where their destination could be. They're just sitting there waiting. They're waiting it out. Destination hell. Can you keep walking by without saying something about Christ to that section? And is it that real? Yes, it's that real. It's that real. It's heaven or hell. There's nothing in between. What are you going to do this week? You see, there's a guy walking past his house that was on fire. And the whole house is on fire, and he says, Well, the, hey, the house is on fire. The family's in there. They're all sleeping. Middle of the night, the house is on fire. What do you do? Would it be criminal to keep walking? Would it be criminal to keep walking? We would say that, right? Is it criminal as a Christian to keep walking? Is it a criminal? Are you a criminal to keep walking if you know where their destination's at? And you know who I'm talking about. God has put some neighbor on your heart, some coworker on your heart. It's criminal as a Christian to walk by. Well, I'm not gonna even, I'm not, I'm not a fireman. I can't do nothing about that fire. Even if you're not a fireman, you gotta respond. The house is on fire, folks. What are you going to do today? What are we going to do when we leave this church today? Can everybody stand up? Listen, in the moment of hearing some awesome praise reports this morning, it fires me up to know that some of you in here are really sharing the gospel, man. I love it when somebody baptizes someone. It fires me and Josh up. Why? Because it means that evangelism is still alive and revive. Could we do better? Yes, we can do better. How do we do better? Let's all do it. Every one of us in here, share the gospel this week. Lord, I come before you today, Father. And Father, I pray, Lord, today that if somebody in here...